I'm Adam Grant. I'm here with Mitch Album, brilliant journalist and author. You may know him from Tuesdays with Maury, The Five People You Meet in Heaven, and today, new book, The Magic Strings of Frankie Presto. Welcome. Hi, Adam. So what inspired you to write the latest book? Well, ever since I wrote Tuesdays with Maury, uh, I've had people who have said to me, that book changed my life. You actually said it to me <laughs> not too long ago. And I have to say the first hundred times that that happened, I probably internally rolled my eyes and said, well, that's nice, but I mean, a book doesn't change your life. It's a book. Having heard it so many times at this point, I started to think, well, you know, actually, people's gifts do change other people's lives. And uh, I, I got intrigued about maybe writing a story about how that would happen. And I'd always been a musician. Um, I buried it after I became a writer, but my real dream was to be a musician, and I had, you know, I worked at it when I was younger. So I came up with a story about a fictional guitar player named Frankie Presto, who's the greatest guitar player to ever walk the earth. The, the, the music gods have just chosen him to be their, their vessel. And uh, he suffers as a child. He's an orphan, and he goes through a, you know, a lot of abandonment. And as a result, he's sort of rewarded with this magic guitar when he's nine years old that has six strings that are able to change people's lives. And over the course of his life, which traverses through the whole 20th century of music, the real 20th century of music, Duke Ellington and Elvis Presley and Woodstock and all the rest, he, he gets these opportunities to play so brilliantly that he actually changes somebody's life. And when he does, the string turns blue, and then it dissipates and disappears, and then he has five left and four left and three left and two left. And it, it follows the story of that, but the metaphor and the kind of point behind it is that Everybody gets a blue string in life. You know, they have a gift, and if they share that gift with somebody, they can actually change somebody else's life. You became a professor, uh, and now you teach, and I'm sure some students along the line have said, you know what, I want to do what he does, or he made this so clear to me that I want to now pursue that. So now you have, as a professor, changed somebody's life with your particular gift of teaching. I've written books and people say, oh, that's changed my, my life. Uh, a, a, a pianist could give a performance and someone in the audience could say, my God, that music, I want to make that music myself. And now they want to become a pianist. So all of us have this ability to sort of um, play a blue string. And I just thought that that was an interesting uh, theme to write a book about. I think it's fascinating. And it makes me wonder, how do you think about discovering what that gift is? Well. Uh, that's a very good question because I think a lot of people have gifts that they deny and uh, they want to be something other than what their gift is or they see that their gift is not satisfying enough that, that well, yeah, you know, so what that I'm good at music, but, you know, I want to be a, a baseball player, you know, or uh, so what that I'm good at sports, but I really want to be this or or this gift doesn't make me enough money or this gift doesn't get me famous. But I think that if people recognize that everybody has a talent of some kind, and in this book, which is actually told by the spirit of music, it's, uh, and I did it on purpose, so the narrator is music. It's music itself. And he comes at the beginning of the book to take the talent out of Frankie Presto's body because he just died. And he's going to take the talent out and he's going to distribute it over other souls. And music explains that here's how talents work. When you come out of the womb, before you ever even open your eyes, you're an infant, there's all these colors that you can actually see, bright, brilliant colors. And when you clench your fists for the first time, you're actually grabbing the colors that appeal to you and taking them, and those become your talents. So why does one kid grow up to have a great aptitude for math? and another kid grows up as a great dancer, and another kid just is naturally musical. And we always say, where did that talent come from? Well, in the book, the talent comes from because that's what you grabbed. If you recognize that the talent that you grabbed, you grabbed for a reason. This is my conceit. You know, way early on, it attracted you. For some reason, it was a good fit for you. And you allow yourself to sort of explore your talent and, and develop your talent, not be jealous of other people's talent, but just say, this is what I do well, let me do it well, you will be at peace with your talent and you'll be effective with it. So talk to us about this in your own life. Um, we have millions of readers who are grateful that you walked away from music, but what, what was that decision process like? Well, and why did you come back to it? That's a perfect example. I mean, uh, well, first of all, before I, I, before I ever became a musician, you know, I was one of those kids that did well in school. 
I, I got good grades. And so naturally your parents say, well, you should, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, you know. And many kids at the same uh, level with me went on and did that. And many of them have proven to be quite unhappy because that's not really where their talent lied. That's not really where their gifts were, but that's what society told them to do or somebody else told them to do. I was blessed that despite the fact that my parents wanted me to go do those things, I said, no, music, I feel music, I want to, I want to do music. Uh, and so I pursued music. Music didn't really work out for me. Uh, I volunteered for a local newspaper uh, writing stories. And, uh, and I found that the very, the very first day I wrote a story, I'd never written anything before. I had no training. Uh, but I must have had some kind of aptitude for storytelling because I wrote a, a newspaper story about parking meters. That was my first assignment for a local rag that they gave out in the supermarket. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. Why not, to, <laughs> why not parking meters? And um, they put it on the bottom of the front page when it came out the next week. And I went to the supermarket and I picked it up and I saw my name and I saw the print after it and something clicked in in me. And so there was like almost a shiver. I still get a little goosebump when I tell the story that, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. You know, it's creative, like music, um, uh, but I can use words and my, my brain is kind of coming into it. And I, I settled into it and I found out this is my aptitude. Now, do I still love music? Of course I do. Did I just write a book about music? Yes, I did. But did I have to recognize it? Well, I may have wanted that, but I've got, a, I've got an ability here. And if I cultivate this, it can be just as satisfying, maybe more so, than the music career. And I lucked out, I was able to stumble upon mine, but I think everybody sort of has that if they can do that search. Your career trajectory since then has been so interesting, right? An award-winning sports journalist, then writing memoirs, then turning to fiction. Um, so you're at least tri trilingual as an author. And I, when I think about leadership, I think that actually a lot of leaders are fiction authors in the sense that they have to create a vision that doesn't yet exist. Right? They have to craft a narrative or, or tell a story that hasn't been told before. Um, as, a, as a gifted storyteller, what advice can you offer to leaders about how to create better, more compelling narratives? Well, you know, there's the joke that, uh, you know, prostitution is the oldest profession in the world. I actually think the one that came before it was storytelling. Uh, and the reason that I never fear about, uh, you know, when they say, well, you know, journalism is dead or print journalism is dead or this is that, is that the world has always told stories and it will always have to tell stories. And so the first thing that I would, I would say to leaders of any kind is everyone can relate to a story. And if you learn how to tell a story, whether that be your vision for a company or um, just a way to be empathetic towards your customers or a way to just understand the world, if you put it in a storytelling form as opposed to a, a didactic, factual PowerPoint presentation, everyone will be able to relate to it. I have an orphanage that I run down in Haiti, and the, uh, I go every month, and the kids' natural language is not English. First they speak Creole, and then they speak French, and then we teach them English, and so they're slowly getting into it. When I stand in the middle of the group of kids, I, and I try to relate some kind of thing or what a story, uh, you can see that they're looking at me, but they don't necessarily understand what I'm saying. They're various ages and they're English. But when I start to move my hands and my inflection reflects happy and then angry and then sad or whatever, um, they come alive. And if I'm telling a story with that, that kind of stuff, even if they don't get the words, you can tell that they're intrigued by whatever story I'm telling because it's got all the elements of story, a narrative, emotion, a give and a take, conflict, and all the rest of it. So sometimes leaders should remember that, you know, it may be important to you, and you think, well, if I just spit the facts out, people will, but, but one of the best ways to relate to somebody is not to uh, lecture them, but to tell them a story. And so I always found that if I was trying to make a point about something, rather than saying, um, you know, uh, here's the simplest thing in sports. The baseball player hits 333. That's a fact, right? Baseball player hits 333. Or one out of every three times that he comes to the plate, something good happens. Now, which tells you more about, which intrigues you more about the baseball player, right? It's the same fact, but if you tell it in a little bit of a narrative, now you've engaged somebody that way. And you know, I think leaders should probably keep that in mind. How do we know when a story is worth telling or when we're on to a compelling narrative? Some of it is if it's passion 
it to you than it will be to someone else. Uh, there is no empirical litmus test, I don't think, about whether a story is interesting or not. I've heard people, you know, tell stories about the invention of a chemical compound and, and hold people's attention, and I've heard other people tell a war story and put people to sleep. So it, it, it's, it has a lot to do, I think, with the passion of the storyteller. What does your creative process look like? Well, I'm, I, I'm pretty predictable, and I, I know sometimes there's this notion that uh, writers, you know, they just get hit with lightning in the middle of the night, and they get up and they start scribbling, and, and, and you know, next thing you know, they got a novel. But I, I have to say that that's not really the case in my experience with, with me or with most writers that I know who, who make a living at this. Uh, I get up every morning about the same time. I follow a very similar pattern. I, I get up, brush my teeth, say a prayer, grab a cup of coffee, and go downstairs and start writing. I don't read anything else. I don't look at anything else. I don't listen to anything else. I don't turn on a television. I have no input. I want my brain to be a blank slate as close as it can be. And then I begin to fill up that slate with the words and the creativity. I work for maybe from about uh, a quarter to seven in the morning till maybe 9.30, uh, you know, quarter to, quarter to 10, and I'm done. And I've recognized that I could sit at the computer for 10 more hours, I'm not gonna get anything better. So I know when to stop, I'm out of gas, and then I come back the next day. But I do it every day, uh, except when I'm out on book tour like this, and it's almost impossible, but I do it every day, I do it seven days a week, and I, I try never to quit when things are going badly. And this, I think, is a good lesson for no matter what walk of life you're in, because no matter what, there's always gonna be an end of a day for you, whatever that end of the day is gonna be. Mine is this sort of run out of gas point. But if you stop when you're in the middle of something that's not going well, and you say, ah, I'll come back tomorrow, and this, these sentences just aren't working, I'll, I'll go out when I'm fresh tomorrow. When you get up the next day, you are not in, excited about going back down to that computer because you're like, ah, oh, that problem is down there waiting for me. On the other hand, if you quit in the middle of a sentence that's just great, you say, stop, then you can't wait to get back to it the next morning. And, uh, you know, I think that's probably a good philosophy all across the board. Do you find as you're writing, if I heard you correctly, you write less than three hours a day, yeah. typically? That's remarkable as, as a writer. Well, uh, it... You know, they say the average American uh, in an eight-hour day only actually does between two and two and a half hours of real work, and the rest is emailing and phone calls and coffee breaks and daydreaming. And so uh, if you applied that principle to my writing hours, it's concentrated writing. It's not, I, I don't veer off. Um, but I think, you know, creativity is funny that way. You know, you... I, it's a little bit like uh, Play-Doh. I mean, you can mold it uh, into different shapes or different hours of your day, but you only still have as much Play-Doh as you have, you know. And it's you could stretch it out, and you could sit at a typewriter, like I say, for ten hours, and you'll get you'll get the same amount of Play-Doh stretched out, or you could compress it and do it into an app. I have to say, mo it's not surprising pattern for most writers. It may be to you, but uh, to most of the novelists I know. First of all, they all treat it like a job. You know, get up, go someplace. A lot of people have separate offices from their home because they don't want to mix the environments, you know, and they want to, I know some writers that actually go to an office building and sit with other writers, one at a desk and one at a desk, and they all work on their own novels together. These are, these are not, uh, fiction writers, but they want it to feel like a job which is ironic because a lot of people who have those kind of jobs dream about like, oh, if I could just be a novelist and I could sit at home and smoke my pipe and write my thing and look at the ocean. But a lot of people who have that option choose to come into an office. Um, I, uh, I have a, a separate office downstairs below everything so that there's no traffic and no you know, normal life. Otherwise, I might do the same thing. I've also found that if the view is too nice, you don't focus on your work. So, uh, I, you know, I'm blessed to live in an, an area that has uh, a, a nice uh, woods and everything that I could look at, and I'm always, I always position everything away from it so I'm not distracted. How do the stories you tell shape your own identity? Um, as, you, as you write a book or a column that you spend a lot of time on, does it change the way that you think about who you are? No, uh, what changes is the reception to it. Uh, for example, um, Tuesdays with Maury, 
I wrote to pay Maury's medical expenses. It wasn't supposed to be a big book. It wasn't supposed to be a philosophical book. Nobody even wanted to publish it. I mean, I got turned down 90% of the places I went. They said, you're a sports writer, it's depressing, nobody wants to read anything like that, et cetera. But I pushed forward because I wanted to pay his medical bills before he died, and that's what we did. Now, for me, what changed for me was when I was visiting with Maury and, and the transformation that I went through and the lessons that I learned, and then I put that down on the page. But what changed as a result of the book wasn't my writing of the story, because it had already happened to me. It was the reception to the book. Uh, Amy Tan, who's, you know, who wrote The Joy Luck Club and is a friend of mine, I had sent her the manuscript for Tuesdays with Maury because she was like one of the only people I knew who maybe delved in that area a little bit. Most people I knew were sports writers. I said, well, what do you think? Do I have anything here? I, I have never written a book like this. And she said, well, I'm, she read it and she said, I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, this is a wonderful book and it's going to be really big, which I didn't believe at the time. And she said, number two, you're about to become everybody's rabbi. And uh, I had no <laughs> idea what that meant, but I sure do now because... Everyone who has ever dealt with a terminal illness, ALS, whatever, who comes through my path wants to talk to me, wants to hear what I have to say, wants to share a story with me or whatever, and so, which is fine. I mean, that's, that's, it's been a blessing. But it does change you, you know, uh, the conversations you have and the way that people look at you uh, and, and what they look for from you has changed uh, and has changed with every book, really. What was the biggest impact that Tuesdays with Maury had on you? Um, if you think about, I and mean, there's so many inspiring lessons in that book, what was the one that has really stuck with you the most? Personally or professionally? That's one of each. Well, personally, um, I think the way that Maury would say, you know, don't buy the culture if you don't like it. And I saw that he was able to be sort of countercultural himself. Not, he wasn't a radical, just certain things that he didn't care for, he didn't buy into, and he died quite contentedly, albeit with the worst disease you could ever imagine. And I saw that, I said, okay, that's always stuck with me. And, and there's a lot of things that I just don't get into in American life that everybody gets into. Like reality TV for me is, it's not, I don't even have an opinion on it because it's non-existent for me. I don't allow it to become part of my life. I don't know any of these people. I know who the Kardashians are because you can't live in this country and not know who they are, but I don't know which one's which. And, and, and it's fine. I, I push a lot of that stuff to the side. And other parts of the culture I embrace. And I learned that from Maury. And I think that's why I've been able to do as much as I've been able to do is just, I, I don't feel obligated to play on every field, just the ones that interest me and I think I can make a, a difference in. Um, professionally, you know, Tuesdays with Maury uh, uh, took me off of a path of um, pure sports writer ambition and plopped me into a whole different world. Uh, the best way that I can think of this is uh, when I was a sports writer, solely. Um, people would stop me maybe in airports if they recognized me from the sports reporters or something like that, and they'd say, uh, hey, who's going to win the Super Bowl? And I learned from Chuck Daly, the coach of the Pistons, he would always say, answer them, but never stop moving your feet. You know, Keep moving your feet. And so I would move my feet. I'd say, the Patriots, you know, and I'd just keep walking. And then after Tuesdays with Maury came out, people would stop me in the airport and they'd say, you know, my mother just died from ALS, and I wonder, can I talk to you about it for a second? Well, you can't go, Patriots! <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and so you have to stop, and um, you have to engage. And consequently, I have heard so many stories that I have, I think what it did for me, Adam, is it developed a sensitivity to the suffering in the world and the pain in the world that I did not have before that. And I remember a few years after Tuesdays with Maury going to football games and beginning to look at the crowds that I would be sitting amongst. And, you know, you, I always work amongst 60, 70, 80,000 people. You know, I mean, that's a common uh, office for me. And I would look at the crowd and I'd say, at least half of those people who are jumping up and down and screaming have lost somebody in their life in the last six months and have a sad story to tell, you know. 
and I started to realize how many people are just walking around with these stories and then all of a sudden I hear them because I'm the guy that they can tell them to. So it's made me sensitive to that and recognize that you can't just judge somebody by whatever expression they happen to have on their face or they're yelling or they're laughing. Everybody walks around with some heartbreak in their, in their soul and some more than others. On the lighter side, uh, one of the things we see a lot of business leaders doing is trying to emulate great sports coaches. Yeah, uh, what, You've been observing sports for decades. What are the, the biggest lessons that you've learned from the greatest of great coaches? Well, you know, I, I'm not sure I buy into that whole business equals sports thing. I just think it's easy. And um, I think a lot of coaches are, are, are admired by um, leaders of business. And it's turned into a cottage industry for coaches to sort of create these um, winning philosophy books. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you just follow my 10 rules of, for success, you know, but, you know, one of the rules for success for many of these guys is make sure you get a number one draft pick, you know, uh, or make sure you recruit the best athlete to come to your college. And it's not so easy. You know, some of that is luck of the draw. Some of that is, is uh is where you're geographically located. I'm not sure coaches have the secret to how to run a successful business. I just think they're easy targets because, uh, uh, you know, you can see their success on the field. The best coaches that I've seen are the ones that understand that you have to simultaneously be coaching a team and an individual at the same time. Again, Chuck Daly, who comes to mind, used to say, you know, and, and Bo Schembecker told me this too, I treat them all fairly, but I don't treat them all alike. And, uh, you know, they understood that this guy may require a little bit of extra, and this guy, just a tap in the back, and he's good to go, and this guy. And some people want to cookie cutter everybody. Some people want to make sure when they run their companies that everybody follows exactly the same rules and they send out emails and they say, this is our policy and this is it. But everybody's going to ingest that differently. And you can't make a person into a, a, a robot soldier. Uh, you may think that by everybody standing lockstep and everybody moving at the exact same time, you've got an efficient operation. But what you're missing is the efficiency that could come from cultivating everybody's particular talent while still moving towards a greater good. Now, I think a lot of the younger companies, quote unquote, the newer companies, they might almost take it the opposite direction. It's like you do your laundry here, eat your food here, or, you know, you'll be part of our thing and be whoever you are, wear whatever you want. And, and I, I think sometimes that can go too far the other way. And, and, and all people really are doing is sort of using your company as a springboard for their own personal, you know, startup. Uh, but somewhere in between the two is the right balance, and that's what good sports coaches do. You know, you find that the players all buy into the program, but they don't all get told the exact same thing. Yeah. We started this conversation with you being surprised that Tuesdays with Maury had a life-changing impact on some people, and I have to imagine that there are some books you've read that have had that kind of effect on you. If you were going to point to one or two, what would they be? Well, the Bible ranks up there. Uh, you know, and I only say that half kiddingly in that I think there are uh, there are psalms that when I found, you know, I had a stretch of time in my life where I was going through a, a lot of uh, trouble and issues. And, uh, you know, I'd never been a person who really thought much about reading the Bible for any kind of comfort. I had a, a very, very extensive religious education when I was a kid. I went to a religious uh, day school and high school for much of my life, so I knew a lot about it. But I put it all aside when I got out. But there are some beautiful psalms written by uh, David that I find that actually encompass all of sort of the human misery and the desire to, you know, like, help me, help me, you know, come to my aid. And, and uh, those things, you know, if you talk about a, the printed word having an effect, I have to first say that of anything that I've ever read, when I, you read that you, you realize this was written by somebody thousands of years ago, and it's exactly what you're feeling in terms of like, come to my aid and help me. It's, it's like, wow. So people felt this way even then. And, and, you know, I know that people, the minute they hear religion, they go, well, I don't want to have anything to do with this. But read the Psalms. The Psalms are a little bit different than, you know, uh, 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 the golden calf or, uh, or Noah's Ark. Uh, and then as far as books that, um, 
you know, are, 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 are secular. Most of them have inspired me um, from a writer's point of view, you know, like what you can create if you're really good. And uh, uh, I look at a book like uh, A River Runs Through It, written by Norman McLean when he was in his 60s, you know, not even published until he was almost 70, and then, you know, he didn't even live to see the movie made out of it. And it is poetry about his own life. And uh, you read those sentences, and, you know, even the end of the book, I'm paraphrasing, but said, you know, uh, in, in the end, uh, all things come together and, uh, you know, and, and, and become one, and a river runs through it. I'm haunted by waters, you know. And you can read that a thousand times over and still say, what beauty. I want to create something that beautiful. And um, I think that that's how books like that have inspired me. What would you say, as you reflect on your career to date, is something you believed early on about what it took to be successful or to, to have some influence that you've decided is no longer true? Uh, that ambition was equal to, it was a, a direct equation to success. That the more you pushed and the more you wanted, the more you got. I have come to observe that although this defies physics, there are times when if you take your foot off the gas, you go faster. I don't know how it works. I could not explain it through the laws of physics. I just have observed that it does. I used to think that eh, it was the only way to go. And uh, I, 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 I find that that's not true. Mm -hmm. And you've actually spent a good chunk of your career working in organizations. Mm. Uh, you have a, a chance as a journalist and as a writer uh, to, to hold up a mirror a little bit and think about how does this organization really run? How should it work differently? What are the mistakes that you see people making when they think about how to organize the way that people work together? Uh, well, you're right. I, I have, especially in the last number of years, as I've formed charities, because your know, writing is a fairly solitary existence. It's uh, your, your organization is an organization of one. Uh, but as I have uh, gotten more and more into charity work, I, I operate an orphanage in Haiti that I'm at every month. I have a, about 20-some-odd mm, about people working, I like to say with me, not for me, uh, in Detroit on all my assorted charity things and other ventures. I think the mistakes that I've made, and so therefore I see other people uh, make, is that uh, when you are the driving force of a company, um, the element of not wanting to disappoint you becomes part of everybody's work day. And the way that you talk to people or the way that you might even praise somebody else has a direct effect on the performance of the other people. And you want to say, well, I wasn't talking to you, you know, or why should that bother you? Or, uh, you know, and, and what you need to understand is if you are in a company where you are kind of the magnet that drew the people there or that they look to you for leadership at the top, you have got to consider the way that they are processing the information that you're putting out, even if it's to somebody else. If you ignore it and you just say, look, this is, I'm, I'm the boss and I say this to this and I say this to this and that's all that should matter, you're going to have trouble. And you're going to go, what's wrong? Why, why isn't that person doing what I thought they should do? Why are they reacting to that? And then ultimately, when you get down to it, you find out that they were jealous of your praise of somebody else or, or uh, uh, angry that you didn't notice something that they did or uh, overly content because you praised them and they thought, well, I'm home free. So the way that you come across to people within your own organization is not as simple as just saying, I've called you all together here and I'm going to say this. Does everybody got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to sit with each person and say, okay, no one else is here because group think is one thing and individual think is another. And it's, I see it when I go out and talk to groups. You know, you say, okay, are there any questions? You know, everybody looks around, no questions. One person raises their hand, everybody's hand goes up. Why? If you had a question, you had a question. Obviously, there's a dynamic, right? Same thing in running an organization. And you have to recognize, therefore, that what you would get one-on-one, -on -one, if you took the time with your employees one-on-one, -on -one, is not what you're going to get when you call them all together. And if you really want to understand what's going on in your place, you better sit down one-on-one -on -one periodically with those people. Terrific. Well, Mitch, thank you for sitting down one-on-one -on -one here. My pleasure. Thanks, Adam. Thank you.